So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Matan Ayla from the Weizmann Institute, who's going to talk about rigidity of Riemannian embeddings of discrete metric spaces. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, um, I'm, uh, I'm happy to be here. First of all, thank you for inviting me. And uh, uh, like Jacob said, I'm going to talk about rigidity of Riemannian embeddings of dis discrete metric spaces. And this is um, I'm Atan, I'm a PhD student from Weizmann, and I'm a student of Boaz. This is joint uh, work with Boaz, my advisor. And uh, okay, so let me start. So uh, first of all, our setup. So we have a, a manifold. Oops, uh, okay. So we have a manifold uh, M. And our manifold will always be completed connected. I'm gonna say what, what complete means in a second. And with no boundary, okay? Um, at some point I'm gonna talk about manifolds with boundary, but, but in, in general with no boundary. And we consider this uh, manifold as a metric space. So if I have two points in my manifold, the distance is just the infimum of length of curves connecting these two points, okay? And the fact that the manifold is complete uh, mean, means that it's complete as a metric space. So uh, every Cauchy sequence converges. And by the hope for enough theorem, it's equivalent to saying that if I have a, a geodesic, I can continue it indefinitely in both directions. So every geodesic is defined for all time. Okay, so both of these um, uh, are equivalent and the fact that the manifold is complete, uh, it, it implies that for any two points, for any two points in the manifold, X and Y, I can connect them by a minimizing geodesic. Minimizing geodesic uh, means that the length of this curve uh, equals the distance between these two points. Okay, this uh, geodesic is not necessarily unique. For example, if you take the sphere, and you take two antipodal points, so you have a lot of uh, great circles connecting these two points. Uh, each of these are minimizing. Okay, so this is a minimizing geodesic. And by the way, I didn't say it, but uh, you can feel free to stop me if you have any questions or remarks. So uh, feel free to jump in. It's fine. Or if you don't hear me or don't see anything. So. Okay. And uh, we are interested in um, isometric embeddings of a uh, metric space. Like we said, so what does it mean to, um, for a metric space X to be isometrically embedded inside the manifold? It means, and we write it like this, this X is a, is a metric space and I isometrically embed it inside the manifold. It means that I have a map, this map from uh, my metric space to the manifold that preserves distances, okay? So the distance in the manifold between the images of the two points is the same as the distance uh, between these two points uh, in the metric space. Okay, this is uh, isometric embedding. And it's sometimes convenient to think about uh, this isometric embedding as, uh, as when the metric space is just a subset of our manifold. So if I have some manifold, some part of the manifold, it's without boundary, but I have I can think about the images of the points of X. So we will mainly talk about discrete uh, metric spaces. And for each between, um, for each of each pair of points, I know the distance between them in manifold, the intrinsic distance inside uh, the manifold is the same as their distance in, um, in the metric space, okay? These two are equal, okay? So sometimes more convenient to think about uh, my metric space as a subset of the manifold. Any questions uh, so far about what's isometric embedding? Okay, so let's talk a little bit uh, about uh, some result about uh, finite metric spaces. So what do we know about isometric embedding in the finite case? So I have a finite metric space and I want to say something about the existence of an isometric embedding. So if I have a metric space, metric space with at most uh, three points, I can always embed it inside R2, it's no problem, I can embed these uh, three points and uh, just have a triangle uh, inside my uh, Euclidean plane. Okay, but if I have metric spaces of four points, even four points are some metric spaces that I can't embed not only in, in uh, 
Euclidean plane, not only in Euclidean space, but in any complete Riemannian manifold, they can't admit it because they violate some, uh, some basic property that uh, Riemannian manifolds have. And these kind of matrices are branching matrix spaces. Okay, so what is a branching matrix space? So I have four points, four points X, Y, Z, and W here. And I have this uh, setting where X, Y, and Z, these three points, X, Y, and Z are collinear. So Y uh, lies on the minimizing geodesic between X and Z. So these three points are collinear. And X, Y, and W are also collinear. Okay. However, the four points are not collinear. So uh, Y, Z, and W are not collinear, and Y, W, and Z are not collinear. Okay, so I have this picture. And for example, this picture, we can think of a tree uh, with a root connected to three nodes. So here, the distances are one, for example. This kind of metric space, I can't embed it inside any Riemannian manifold because like I said, it violates the, the, the property that geodesics cannot branch. If I have a geodesic that overlap, then they must coincide. So I, I, I can't have this picture inside the Riemannian manifold. So this kind of metric spaces, they do not embed isometric in any uh, complete Riemannian manifold. Okay, but if I um, just um, lose this degeneracy, um, then, then I can uh, say, things about, um, about isometric embeddings. So while then the Rostovsky um, showed that if I have a non-branching, non so it's, it's not the case that I just mentioned, four point matrix says I can isometrically embed it inside uh, some constant curvature surface. So here SKN is just a complete simply connected n dimensional manual manifold of constant curvature. Okay, if the curvature is positive, it's the sphere. If it's zero, then it's the Euclidean space. And if it's negative, then it's the hyperbolic space. Okay, so if I have a four point matrix, I can always isometrically embed it inside some manifold. And they give also a characterization uh, in different cases. For example, if three points are collinear, if all points are collinear, they say, what are the curvatures that, that you can embed it in? But I don't want to get into it, but they give a characterization of. Uh, all of the all of the cases. Okay, this is a, a four point matrix spaces. But what about finite? Maybe more than four non branching matrix spaces. Um, so just uh, some result. I'm going to explain how to uh, some uh, reasoning about it in a second. Um, is that any finite non non branching matrix space embeds isomerically in some complete Riemannian surface. So a two-dimensional manifold, I don't need more than two dimension, but maybe it can have a large genus. So let's see um, how you do it. So let's take, for example, five-point metric space. I have a five-point metric space, non-branching, and I want to embed it inside the toes, okay? So how do you do it? I take the complete graph, okay? Complete graph, every two, a complete graph of five vertices, every two vertices have an, have an edge connecting them, okay? So I can't embed it in, in the plane, it's not a planar graph, but I can embed it on the toes, just like I drew here. Okay, this is a topological embedding of this um, complete graph of five vertices. Okay, topological embedding means that, uh, that uh, vertices are points and edges are uh, curves and two curves do not uh, cross. cross one. Okay, so I topologically embed it. And now what do I do? I define a Riemannian metric that will be very, very large on, on the complement of these curves. Okay, here it will be very large, almost infinite, and assigns the proper value, the proper length to these curves. Okay, so it, it makes you, if you want to go from one point to another, it, it forces you to go through this uh, curve, this uh, geodesic, and that's how you can prescribe uh, the proper distances uh, between. Uh, points and if you have more than five points, then okay, no problem. Maybe you can take uh, uh, very many many holes and you can topologically embed any graph uh, in a sufficiently high genus surface, and then you do the same procedure, and you have this um, this isometric embedding. Okay, any questions so far? Something. Okay, so. 
let's get to our case. What about countable metric spaces? Okay, so finite metric spaces, we know some things and, and other results I didn't mention, but what about countable metric spaces? So let's take, for example, the model this metric space. So what do I have here? I have, um, this is a subset of R3. Okay, this is a subset of R3, where I have um, in Z equals zero floor, this is the, the purple part. This is Z equals zero. Okay, so here I have um, Z2. Okay, I take all the points in Z2 with, with integer, uh, integer coordinates. Okay, and I add another point. I add this point uh, zero, zero, 001. Okay, and I treat this as a metric space where distances are just Euclidean. So here, and the distance between two adjacent points is one, and here is one, and here is the square root of two, and uh, just Euclidean distance, okay? So the question we asked ourselves, our motivating question, can I take this um, metric space? It's countable. I can take any finite chunk and embed it like we just saw. I can take any finite number of points and embed them in a surface, right? But can I embed the entire, um, the entire metric space it's countable matrices inside a surface, a completely Riemannian surface. Okay, and the answer is no. The answer, our answer to this question is negative. You can't, you can embed it in a three-dimensional manifold, of course, R3 is where it was taken from, but you can't embed it in any two-dimensional uh, Riemannian manifold, complete two-dimensional. And why is that? This is just because of the theorem we proved that if you take uh, Z2, Okay, just integer coordinates, and you isometrically embed it in a surface. And this surface is, is, is the Euclidean plane. It's isometric to the Euclidean. So let's say I took this um, purple points, all of these purple points, and I isometrically embedded them inside uh, some manifold. Now I have a flat manifold. I have this Euclidean plane. Now I have no place to put the additional point and preserve distances, right? There is no point in, our, in, in the Euclidean plane that have distances that this point have from all the points of Z2. Okay, I have no place to put this point. Okay, so this is the main result. This is the main result. And now I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, generalizations because I don't need Z2. I can have any lattice and even every, every net is fine, but this is maybe the picture that's nice to have in our heads of this Z2 that I embedded inside I take this Z2 and I embed it inside a two-dimensional Riemannian manifold, complete and connected. And so this manifold must be isometric to Euclidean plane. Okay, so any questions about this result? Maybe something is not clear or, or is everything? Can I just ask, uh, did we, um, uh, we're, we're embedding it into a complete connected Riemannian surface. So that means the dimension is two, right? Yes, yes. 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 Always. Uh, uh, yes. The dimension is two. I'm going to talk about the n-dimensional and always the. Um, um, okay. Yes. The dimension here is two. The dimension should always be uh, the same. Otherwise, of course, I can embed it inside R three, and it's not isometric. Right. Right. Um, okay. So, like I said, um, this uh, proof um, generalizes it. Wait, someone asked a question. Why can't M uh, have a larger metric of the lattice? Um, what do you mean? Why can it have a larger? Okay, so I have, so, so I'm not sure what the question, but the picture to have, let's say I have this manifold. Okay, let's say I have this manifold. Okay, now I took all the purple points, all the purple points of the two, and I uh, embedded them. Uh, like the torus example. Okay, just um, this is this is the result. I can the, the result is that that I can't have. You would expect that maybe I could have like an infinite genus thing and connect them, but the, the result is that that you can. That if you have, you can embed all of these points, all of these points of Z two here many, 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 many points. And you know the distances here, every distance here is Euclidean, all distances here are Euclidean. Then it flattens, it flattens your, your, um, your uh, manifold. Somehow it enforces it to be isometric too. Um, and this is, yeah, I, I, just, I just drew a chunk. 
of course, it's, it's infinite. So, so there are a lot, many, many, many geodesics. That, uh, okay, so we will see. I hope I hope we see some of the proofs on it. Um, okay, so uh, like I said. So like I said, it generalizes easy to any lattice and uh, apparently it holds for more general discrete set, which are nets and also uh, quasi nets, uh, but I'm not gonna talk about it. If, if you have any questions at the end, quasi nets is a little more inclusive than, than a net, but not very. Um, so, so what is a net, a net? Um, so now it's in N dimension. So a set L in Rn is a net. If um, every point in Rn is of bounded distance, from this set, okay? I have some uh, delta, at every point, uh, x here, then I have some point y of my net, such that the distance here is at most uh, delta. Delta is constant, let's say three. So um, every point has some point uh, from uh, my set. So of course, Z2 is a net and every lattice uh, is a net. And so it's, it's a generalization and the theorem same theorem, but uh, for nets, if I have a manifold, which is complete connected to dimensional Riemannian manifold, and I was able to isometrically embed some net uh, from R2 inside it, then it must be isometric to, uh, uh, to the Euclidean plane. So just like in Z2 or any lattice, so it's, it, it works for a net. And the same corollary that we had in our uh, model, um, just formulate it in in, in more general um, language. So I have some set in R3 that's not contained in any affine plane. For example, this um, set that we talked about. So we have Z2 plus a point. So it's not contained in any affine plane. But there is some affine plane um, such that the intersection, the inter intersection is a net. So of course, this affine plane is just the Z equals zero and the intersection is a net inside it. So the same reasoning uh, works, and you can say that this X does not embed isometrically in any complete Riemannian surface. Okay, the same reasoning we said for Z2 plus a point, once I embedded this uh, lattice, I have no place to put the additional point that will preserve distances between it to every point. Um, okay, and this is a, some generalization and now um, we, oh, okay, so I'm, I'm just gonna say in a second, but we don't know the n-dimensional analog of this theorem. We don't know that if we take a net from Rn and embed it in an n-dimensional complete connected Riemannian manifold. So this manifold is um, isometric to the Euclidean space that we don't know yet. But we still think that maybe um, the ability to give a dimension to a metric space could be interesting. So maybe maybe it's a, it's, it's not meaningful if we want for any dimension. Uh, we hope that it is. So the, we define the asymptotic Riemannian dimension as the minimal dimension of a complete uh, Riemannian manifold in which the the metric space embeds. So it's a dimension of a metric space. So for example, again, our metric space that we always talk about this um, Z2 plus a point. So somehow this um, theorem was able to capture the fact that it's in some sense three-dimensional um, because you can't embed it in a two-dimensional manifold, but you of course can embed it in a three-dimensional or just the Euclidean space. Okay, so maybe this notion will be meaningful. And now a definition that maybe uh, will help us um, uh, formulate our uh, theorems more easily. And connect the Riemannian manifold. So this plays the part of, oh, oh, just a second, I think somehow I did something. Uh, uh, what happened? How do I? Okay, you see again the, Okay, mm -hmm. so here and play the part of, of uh, R2 in the theorem. So if I have some uh, n-dimensional complete connected Riemannian manifold and I have some subset, here it will be a net in, in the, what we know, and I have some subset, we say that it's metrically rigid. If, if whenever I embed it in another manifold, uh, also n-dimensional completely connected, the two must be isometric. Okay, so somehow if a set is metrically rigid, it somehow encodes the geometry of the 
uh, of the manifold. So the theorem says a simple way to formulate it is that nets in R2 in, in the Euclidean plane are metrically, metrically rigid. So the, uh, the geometry of the Euclidean plane, I can encode it in a net. Okay, just uh, knowing all these distances uh, is enough for me to recover all of the um, all of the metric up to an exact. And like I said, we don't know that uh, theorem, uh, the first theorem generalizes to the n dimensional setting, or in other words, we don't know the nets in Rn are metrically rigid. We don't know that. But in any dimension, we have different morphisms. So if I have a complete connected n dimensional Riemannian manifold, and again, I could I, I, I have some net in Rn that embed isometrically, I don't know. In two dimensions, I know item, I know isometry. But here I have deformorphism. Okay, in n dimensions, I always have deformorphism. Okay, and just a remark is that if I add some assumptions on my manifold, here the assumptions are pretty weak, only that it's complete and connected. It's, uh, not uh, strongest assumptions, but if I add more assumptions, for, for example, if the curvature tensor is compactly supported, then, then I can have isometry. Then, then this will turn into isometric if, if I have this additional assumptions. And this is just by reducing matters to some uh, cases of Michel's conjecture, which I'm gonna say what it is in a second, uh, but maybe if you have any questions, so, uh, these are the two main theorems of the paper. The first one is, is the two-dimensional one when I have uh, isometry. Uh, if I could embed a net inside, uh, a net from uh, the plane inside a manifold, then I have isometry. And here in the n-dimensional, I know different. So if you have any questions about this before I move on to some, uh, some related results and hopefully as much of the proof is it's possible, so I'm going to wait uh, for questions. Okay, so boundary rigid. So this is uh, some class of results and also uh, Michel's uh, conjecture. So boundary rigidity is, is an inverse problem. So I have, now I have a manifold uh, with boundary. All the time I said that we don't have boundary, but now we have some, okay, let me do it. So maybe, this is um, my manifold and I have a smooth boundary. And this manifold is said to be boundary rigid if the fact that I know distances between any two points on the boundary determines the metric inside. Okay, so if I have any other metric that agrees on the boundary in the sense of every two points have the same distance, it must be isometric to, to the metric G. Okay, and if, if that happens, then, then the manifold is said to be boundary rigid. Okay, and okay, not all compact manifolds are, are boundary rigid. Of course, I can construct some metric, um, some metric on, on M and have some point here X naught that's very, very far from the boundary, very, very far from the boundary. So, uh, Matan, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but uh, I lost your sound now. I can't hear you. Maybe I'm alone about that. What, what about the rest of you? Can you hear no, me? no, it said that my internet is unstable. Now oh. maybe it's, it's okay. Now I hear you better, yeah. Okay, okay. so again, I'm gonna repeat it. So I can construct a metric it's, um, such that for some point, it's not, it's very, very far from the boundary. Maybe it lies on a huge hill, so. I can change the metric there and it won't affect boundary distances. So, so uh, this kind of uh, manifold is not boundary rigid. And another simple example is the hemisphere. So if I have the hemisphere, okay, and I change um, the metric, I change the metric, change the metric here in some, um, somewhere that's uh, far from the boundary. Okay, I make it larger than the standard metric. Also, it won't affect uh, boundary distances because any two points and can go around the boundary and there is no point, it won't affect. So, 
So this is also not, not boundary region. But Michel's conjecture uh, said, I'm going to say there, there are sets that are boundary rigid, and um, uh, there are manifolds that are boundary rigid. And Michel's conjecture was uh, from 81 is that a manifold is boundary rigid if it's simple. So what's simple? Simple is um, like it says here, two points, any two points are connected by unique geodesic and the boundary is strictly convex. It means that if I have two points on the boundary, so the geodesics connecting them lies, its interior lies inside M. It doesn't go on the boundary. I can't have this image. I can't go like this. Okay, this is not a simple map. Okay, if, I, if the minimizing geodesic goes on the boundary, then this is not the, uh, not a simple map. Okay, so for example, strongly convex sets are, hey, if you take a disk, of course it's uh, any two points that are connected by a line, the interior of it is inside the disk, in the sphere and, and all of these uh, strongly convex sets. And all of these strongly convex sets of constant curvature, um, for example, strongly convex sets of the hemisphere and of the Euclidean space and of uh, symmetric space with constant negative curvature, all of these are boundary rigid. Okay, so if you have another metric and it preserves uh, the boundary distances on the sphere, on the ball, let's say, for example, if you have the ball in R3 and you have another metric such that any two points have uh, just the Euclidean distance, then this metric must, must be isometric to the Euclidean. Okay, and this, the hemisphere case is by Michel in 81 and the Euclidean by Gromov and the symmetric space with negative curvature is uh, the sole quad triangle. I hope I say the name is correct. And, and this conjecture is also known to be true when the manifold is two dimensional. This, this was proven by Pestov and Ullman in 2005. So if I have a two dimensional simple manifold, then it's boundary rigid. Okay, so this is some, it's not very much related, but it's some. Uh, field of uh, rigidity uh, um, I wanted to discuss. So any questions maybe about uh, boundary rigidity? I'm not an expert, but uh, you can try it. Do you okay. have any example? Oh, no, no, you did actually. I'm sorry. OK, so let's talk about another class of results that it's more related to our proof and our results. So this is about manifolds with no conjugate. Okay, so what are conjugate points? So if I have a geodesic gamma, I have two points, connects two points P and Q. They are conjugate if I have a non-zero uh, Jacobi field on this um, geodesic that vanishes at the endpoint. But maybe it's easier to think about it, and it's equivalent actually, if I have a variation of geodesics of this geodesic, all of these are geodesics, okay? And this variation agrees at the endpoints up to first order. Okay, up to first order, this uh, it doesn't have to fix the endpoints, but uh, it agrees up to first order. So for example, antipodal points on, on the sphere, if I have a sphere here, so antipodal points are conjugate. I have, if I have a, a geodesic, right, I can take a variation of great circles and it agrees on the endpoints. Just the endpoints are fixed. Okay, so I rotated this uh, geodesic and I created a variation. So these two points are called conjugate. Okay, and, and, and one important fact that we use is that if I have a geodesic emanating from a point, if I have a point P, I have some geodesic from P, if it reaches a point Q and these two points are conjugate, then the geodesic stops minimizing. So here, this geodesic is no longer minimized. Okay, if you think about the sphere, two antipodal points connecting them in a great circle, so they are conjugate. And indeed, if I continue this great circle, it's no longer minimized. I can go in around the other, um, the other way around. Okay, so these are. Um, this, this is a fact, and it can stop minimizing in other cases also. You can have the cylinder, it can stop minimizing in other cases, but, but this is a one fact. And 
the Cartana Damal theorem, which is a known theorem in, um, in relation to this, um, in, to this area, is that if I have a, a manifold, again, a complete Riemannian manifold with a non-positive curvature, so for example, the hyperbolic space or the Euclidean space, so there are no uh, conjugate points. No, if you take a point, there is no other point that's conjugate uh, to this point. Okay, and um, using the Cartana Damar sometimes formulated otherwise that, that the universal cover is diffeomorphic to the Euclidean space. Um, uh, but this is just a, a result of this. If you have no conjugate point, that the exponential map is non-singular, so it's a covering map, so you have um, this uh, property. And um, okay, maybe I won't say any, anything more about this uh, thing, but um, this, th these results talk about um, what you can uh, learn about the manifold from the fact that it has no conjugate points. So the, first of all, uh, it's mentioned that the converse of Cartana Damard uh, is not true. You can have a manifold with no conjugate points, but still have some positive curvature. Okay, for example, you can take the, the hyperbolic, uh, hyperbolic space, okay, let's say the disk model, and you can change the metric here in a very, very small uh, disk around the origin to have some positive curvature, but you will not introduce any conjugate points. Okay, so the fact that you have no conjugate points, it doesn't mean that the curvature is, is, is non-positive. Okay, we will see that you can do the same thing in the Euclidean space in a second, but, um, but what, what can you learn about, about the manifold from the fact, it's not, it's not useless information, the fact that you have no conjugate points, it's something. So Morse and Hedland, they considered the case of, of, a, of a closed two-dimensional Riemannian. Okay, so this closed two-dimensional Riemannian manifold that has no conjugate points, what can I say about it? Okay, so this, this, um, uh, these surfaces, these closed surfaces, they have a classification. They, they are homomorphic to either the sphere or the sum of tori or the sum of projective plane. Okay, so one thing that you can say if you have no conjugate points, that it's impossible to be homomorphic to the sphere or to the uh, projective plane. This is one thing I'm not going to explain. Uh, uh, it's because of the universal cover, but I don't uh, have enough time to get into it. But okay, so I have a manifold, a, a two-dimensional closed manifold without conjugate points. I already know I can eliminate the possibility that it's the sphere homomorphic to the sphere or the projective plane. But what if it? What if it's uh, homomorphic to the torus or the Klein body? So these two uh, surfaces they have a Euler characteristic zero. Okay, so, okay, so maybe it's a homomorphic one of these and they conjectured and they show some uh, with additional assumptions that if I have um, some metric on these, uh, on these without conjugate points, then it must be flat. It must be the flat metric. metric. Okay, um, and they also considered other, the other cases, uh, but, uh, Let's focus on this one. So um, Hopf in 48, he proved it. So he proved, he showed that if I have a closed Riemannian surface, closed Riemannian surface, two-dimensional surface, always two-dimensional without conjugate points, then the total curvature, the integral, integral of the curvature must be negative or, or zero. And if it's zero, then the curvature vanishes. Okay, so why did this prove the conjecture? So if I have, um, by, the, um, by the gauss bonnet I know that the curvature, I don't have any boundaries. So I know it's two pi times the Euler curve. This is gauss bonnet theorem. Right, so if I know that this is zero, in the case of the post and the, the Klein model, then I know that the total curvature is zero and Hopf tell, tells me that the curvature is zero everywhere. So it's flat. Okay. Um, so this is about the two-dimensional torus. And what and Ivanov in 94 showed it for the n-dimensional torus. So if I have submetric on the n-dimensional torus without conjugate points, then it also must be flat. Okay. Um, they use different Okay, 
So, okay, so we know that the, 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 the converse of Cartan Dama doesn't hold. I don't know a non positive curvature if I have no conjugate one, this is not true. But sometimes it has, a, it has kind of a similar behavior. So, what's non positive curvature? means that if I have a point in my manifold and I take a very, very small ball around this point and infinitesimal small ball, then its volume will be larger than the Euclidean volume of the same radius, of the, of the volume of the Euclidean ball of the same radius. Okay, this is negative curvature. Okay, so sometimes the lack of conjugate points have a similar behavior asymptotically. If I take very, very large Okay, so these, these are two results. And the second one we actually use in our proof. So the first one uh, by Croke in 92 is if I have a compact, compact Riemannian manifold without conjugate points, always without conjugate points. Um, and I take this, um, I denote the volume of the ball of radius half. This is the universal cup. So I take the, the balls in the universal cup here. Yeah? And this is the lift of the metric around some point that projects to P, okay? And the epsilon n is just the volume of the unit ball in Rn. So the volume of the ball um, in this uh, universal cover, it grows at least um, as fast as the Euclidean ball. So, so balls are, are basically asymptotically on a very, very large scale. They, are, they have a volume which is bigger. And, and this is kind of non-positive curvature behavior, like we said. So, you can learn some things about asymptotic growth of the volume, with the fact that you have no conjugate points. Okay, and Banger and Emmerich, I'm not sure that I'm pronouncing it right, but in 2013, uh, they showed, and we use this result, so that if I have some um, manifold that's diffeomorphic to the plane, to, to R2, to the Euclidean plane, and some complete uh, Iranian metric on it without conjugate points, then the area grows at least as fast. Again, the area grows at least as fast as the Euclidean area, okay? And if I have equality, then I know that the metric is flat, okay? So how, how will we use this? And I'm gonna say it again in a second. How do we use this uh, result? So a major part of the proof, in our proof, again, let me remind you. Okay, so maybe let's, um, remind, let's remind ourselves of the setup and, and see how we use this result in order to prove um, our theorem. Okay, any questions uh, so far about anything? Okay. So again, we have some, um, now we're back to our case. We have some um, set L, which is a net inside our N, which embeds isometrically in M. So I have again, this M, and I have some L, here points of L, which I know the distances. The distances are just Euclidean, okay? And sometimes I will treat this L as a subset of Rn, and sometimes I will treat it as a subset of M. Again, like I said, I don't distinguish between a uh, point and its image. So um, I will use this for the characterization. And, and uh, for convenience, I assume that, that uh, the origin is inside. I can always translate the net and uh, it doesn't change it, okay? So what, what will be our strategy? strategy? How will we use Bankert and MH? So the first step is to investigate geodesic passing through some point in L. So I, uh, just a second. So, sorry. So, okay. So again, I have this M and I have these points L. Points of L, and I take one of these points, and I want to investigate geodesic passing through this point. So I, we will show that any any geodesic passing through this point is minimizing all the way. Okay, and if it's minimizing, if every geodesic in any direction is minimizing, then well, the exponential map is a diffeomorphism, and I have diffeomorphism to R n, which is exactly what we stated in the in theorem two. And here the dimension is uh, n-dimensional. I didn't yet restrict to the, to the two dimensions. Okay, so this is the first part of our, the second one. Okay, so now we restrict to the two dimensional. We want to prove theorem one that we have isometry. 
So we restrict to the two-dimensional setting and we show that there are no conjugate points at all. Not only that this point, the, the point of our net doesn't have any con an image of the point of our net doesn't have conjugate, but any two points, any two points are not conjugate. Okay, and now that we know that they are not conjugate, okay, so this is, uh, we're in good shape. We know that they're they not uh, conjugate and we know that I'm deformorphic to R2. So I can use this result. All I need to show is that I have equality here, right? If I can show that I have equality, I know the metric is flat and I know that I have a zone two. Okay, so um, we use the equality case and the fact that the large scale geometry is Euclidean, this is not hard. Just if I have a net, then I have uh, to show that the, 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 the area of a large ball is approximate Euclidean, it's, it's uh, uh, it's not trivial, but it's not as difficult, I guess, than to show uh, that, uh, that I have no conjugate points. So this is, this is the major part in the two dimensional. I think this is uh, the, the hard part is to show that there are no conjugate points. Okay, this is like an overall um, um, scheme of the proof. And now I'm gonna to try to show this theorem too. So I'm gonna just talk about the n-dimensional setup, try to show as much as I can, that if I take a point in my uh, in net, again, thinking about it as a point in my manifold, then every geodesic through it in any direction, it's minimizing all the way. Um, so maybe if you have any questions uh, before I begin, this is, I guess it will be a bit more technical. So maybe if you have any questions on the, uh, on the holistic view of the proof then. Um, okay, so let me let me try and prove um, this uh, theorem and show you maybe the, the tools that we use. So how do I do it? So I fix a point, okay, I fix a point, some point. Again, I'm, I'm thinking about it as a point in my manifold. So I have some point in my manifold, P. And, uh, and for every direction in Rn, or any direction V, I will define um, a minimizing geodesic, okay? A, minim a complete minimizing geodesic defined for all time, okay? Gamma PV, it's denoted gamma PV, at time zero, it passes through P. So some kind of, uh, some kind of geodesic passing through P, okay? I'm gonna give it some notion of direction. I didn't say how still. And, but if I can construct such a geodesic and show that this map, it maps any direction to um, the, the tangent vector of the geodesic or to the geodesic is onto, then I know that every geodesic passing through the point takes this form, so it's minimizing, and I have the diffeomorphism. Okay, the exponential map just give me the diffeomorphism. Okay. The cut locus is empty in this case. If if I have every point. Uh, that leaves P takes this form, it's gamma PV for some V, okay, where it's gamma PV. And I could, if I can prove that it's minimizing, then every geodesic emanating from P is minimizing and the cut locus is empty and the exponential map is a diffeomorphism. And well, the, the tangent space is just, it's diffeomorphic to Rn. So I have diffeomorphism, which was what I wanted to, to show, okay. So now I, I reduced our goal to show, to showing that I can construct such a geodesic, such a minimizing geodesic and prove that this map is on. Okay, so now this is uh, my goal. And um, okay, so how do I do it? Okay, so I use limits of minimizing geodesic that, that are obtained by just connecting this point to other point in my uh, net. So I take this point P here. Okay, this is the point P. And I connect it to a sequence going to infinity. Okay, this is the sequence going to infinity. Okay, it's it's, um, it's norm is going to infinity. These are all points um, in my net, so I know the distances between any of these two points. Okay, and I connect these two in a minimizing uh, um, through a minimizing geodesic, and I know that it exists because the manifold is complete, like we said, and there's no. Okay, so I denote it, I denote just this in this lecture, 
I denote it just like this, this the segment, the minimizing segment connecting P to PM. PM again will always be some sequence uh, going to infinity. We will give it direction. Now, now it can go in any direction, but we'll soon give it a direction, some sequence direction. Um, but this uh, a priori does not converge the sequence of geodesics, but they all pass through a point, so it has a converging some sequence. Okay, so I will, uh, well, maybe sometimes uh, assume that it converges, maybe, uh, uh, maybe not, but, but basically the fact that limits exist, it's not so hard uh, to show. And since I have, again, this sequence tending to infinity, then I know that the limit, that the limit segment, this limit, it's a geodesic ray, right? Because I have points very, very far, very, very far. I connect them. Eventually they will converge. If the limit exists, they will converge to a geodesic ray, right? The geodesic ray defined on all positive times. Okay. And just because the distance function is continuous, I also know that this limit is minimizing. Okay, all of these geodesics, all of these segments were minimizing. I chose minimize, so the limit is also minimizing. So I have a, a minimizing geodesic ray just by connecting these, uh, these points. Okay, so now uh, what I want to do is I want to give some sense of direction. So these points can go in any direction, but I want to say, okay, they go in direction V in some way. Okay, so I want to take these points, I can treat them as Euclidean, right? I have a points, like I said, I have this. A net, sometimes I treat it as, as a subset of Rn, sometimes it's a subset of n. But these are just points. If I think about Z2, for example, or Zn, so these are just points in my lattice. So um, I can have some kind of direction, just Euclidean, treating uh, as Euclidean uh, points. Okay, so we say that this sequence is drifting in direction V. V is some direction on the, on the sphere. And we denote it like this. Okay, so they have two things they have to, uh, to admit. So first, they tend to infinity, like I said. And the second is that their direction, it tends to V. So if I take this point and I look um, on its normalized direction on the sphere, then it tends to V. Just, um, just I think, the most uh, trivial way to tend to, to a direction. Okay. But now we introduce something that's uh, stronger. So now I have not only that I, okay, again, is will always be points uh, drifting to infinity, but now I want that the additive error will tend to zero. So not only um, I have this, uh, this way to tend to V, I also have this more, uh, this stronger way, which we call narrow. So of course, if I, if I, if this condition implies uh, this condition. So, uh, so it's a stronger notion of tending to infinity in direction V, okay? So now what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna connect my point P to points PM. They will tend to infinity narrowly or not. They will tend to infinity in direction V, sometimes narrowly, sometimes not, but this, um, these are the two ways I have um, we introduced to tend to infinity in a direction. So where we use the fact that we have a net, okay? So this, the, the, the main place we use in this part of the proof, later in other parts we use it also for other things, but the main place we use is just this, that the fact that it's a net, it means that in any direction, I have some uh, sequence tending in direction V narrow. So if the direction is E1, I can choose some points that will tend uh, in my net, narrowly in direction uh, V1. This is in place. So once I have this, I can I have all I need. I don't need uh, to use uh, other the fact that I, that I know the distance. Uh, this is where I use the fact that it's a net. Okay, in this part of the book. Yeah. So the lemma um, which we use, I hope, as much as time permits, is in any direction I have a sequence of points. Any direction you choose. In direction v, say I have some sequence of points tending uh, to infinity, narrowly in this direction. And I'm gonna connect my point, the points to these points and create a limit geodesic. So what will be our strategy? Again, I'm trying to prove that. Again, reminding that 
what I want to do is I want to define gamma PV. So I have this point P. And I want to define a minimizing geodesic passing through this point. And I want to show that this map is on. Okay, so how will I do this? So I will choose some sequence tending to V narrowly, some sequence PM tending to V narrowly, like we said. And I'm just going to take its limit. I'm going to define a gamma PV to be this limit. Okay, so I have my point P, and I have a sequence PM. And the P1, P2, I connect all of these and I take the limit. Okay, and this is, will be my gamma PV. And it's important that they will tend narrowly. Okay, so and in any direction I have such a sequence, so there is no problem. Okay, so how do I know that this limit exists? So this is just this um, uh, proposition if I have. Uh, two sequences, one tending narrowly, one tending uh, drifting. Maybe drifting is, is the, the term we use. If I have one drifting narrowly and one drifting uh, not necessarily narrowly, then the limits, both limits of the geodesics exist and they are equal. So if I have some P and I connect it to a sequence of points again, and I do this limit, it exists and it's always the same. If I tend to, in the, if I drift in direction B, it's always the same limit. Okay, this is the first part that we will show. Uh, in, maybe I, will, I won't have time. This is, um, but this is what we show, and and we define gamma PV for any positive time. Like I said, this limit will give me a ray. So for positive time, I have this gamma PV. Okay, what do I do for negative time? I extend it just by looking at the opposite direction. So I just gamma PV for negative time is just gamma P of minus V at the, at the minus of, of T. So this gives me uh, its definition for, uh, for all, of, all of R. Why is it a minimizing geodesic? Because of this proposition. So if I have a P, and I connect it to a sequence in tending narrowly in direction V, and another sequence tending drifting, drifting narrowly in direction minus V. Then the concatenation, if I take the limit and define it for positive time uh, to be this geodesic for negative time, this geodesic will be a complete minimizing geodesic. Okay, so again, what will be our logic? So now I defined gamma uh, PV. And it's a complete minimizing geodesic. And, and, and now how I'm going to show that this map is onto is just by showing that uh, it's continuous and odd. I won't have time, but this is what we do. Okay, the fact that it's odd, it's obvious, right? Just because of this definition. So of course this uh, map is odd, right? And we also show that it's continuous and it's not so difficult, this bar of construction, and therefore it's onto. Okay, because this is a point of the sphere, and this is a point that's not on the sphere, but on uh, something more. Okay, so maybe I don't have much more time, so maybe I'll just talk um, a little bit about um, how we do this. So, uh, not, not getting into details, so what we do is we use a uh, Lipschitz function. So, Lipschitz, func Lipschitz functions are in some sense dual to curves. So, if, if a curve gives me an upper bound on the distance. This is by the definition. So the Lipschitz function give me a lower bound. Okay. So, and we use something uh, called a transport curve. So if I have some geodesic gamma, it's a transport curve of some Lipschitz function. If it's, this function grows in speed one, this, uh, this geodesic, speed one. Okay, and what's useful for us is a, a few properties that we use on transport curves, and maybe I want to time, but um, the most important, maybe two most important is it's a minimizing geodesic, okay? It's not very hard to see. And the fact that if I have a transport curves um, of some Lipschitz functions that intersect, intersect in an interior point, then they must coincide. Can't have this uh, picture 
this being a transport curve and this being a transport curve, this is impossible. Okay, so this will help us uh, in some way show that um, if I have this uh, sequence tending narrowly in direction V and in direction minus V, then this will give me the limit, will give me the concatenation, will give me just a minimizing judgment. So this is uh, mainly the tools that we use, this uh, one Lipschitz functions. Maybe I don't have enough time uh, to talk about, uh, about how we exactly prove, um, but this, this is the, the, the basic tool that allows us to prove these two things. So um, the fact that I can stretch this, um, this uh, geodesics and they, it will give me a complete minimizing geodesic. So I hope some of this was, I think I'm out of time and I hope it was uh, uh, somewhat clear, but um, if you have any questions, then feel free. Mm-hmm.